Real Ponies Don't Go Oink by Patrick McManus. Chapter number one is controlling my life. I just read a book on how to get control of my time and therefore of my life. My time has always had a tendency to slip away from me and do as it pleases. My life follows it like a puppy after an untrained bird dog. Come night, my life shows up usually covered with mud and full of stickers, exhausted but grinning happily. My time never returns. That is why I read this book on how to get control of my time and my life. The book claimed that the key to controlling your time and life is to make a list of all the things that you want to accomplish during the day, the week, and then the year. Things you wish to accomplish are listed according to their level of importance in categories labeled A, B, and C. Under A, you place the things that have top priority for the day. Under B, the things you really should take care of that day or in the immediate future. And then under C, the things that you might do sometime next century. The system sounded wonderful. Finally, I had a way to actually control those two rascals, my time and my life. Time would no longer merely slip away. I'd grab it by the neck, squeeze every second out of it, and toss the empty skin over my shoulder. My life would become a thing of discipline, methodically achieving great accomplishments after great accomplishment. I sat down to start my list. Right off, I was stumped. I needed to think of a great accomplishment to list first under column A. Writing the great American novel would be a good one, I thought, but it would probably take too long. It took me two months to read Moby Dick. How long would it take me to write it? Scratch that idea. My wife, Bun, walked in. Why are you sitting there staring at the window? I'm trying to control my life, I told her. Oh, good, she said. Can you think of something great for me to accomplish? How about putting up the shelf in the pantry like I asked you to? No good. It's too trivial. It's low C at best. It, if it even makes the list. Speaking of lists, where's a pencil? Go look in the junk drawer. I looked in the junk drawer, but all I could find was the stub of a pencil with the eraser worn down flat. Not only do you need a good pencil to get your life under control, but you need a good eraser. I'm going down to the store and buy a new pencil, I told Bun. I hope getting your life under control isn't going to run into a lot of expense, she said. On the way to the store, I bumped into my friend, Wretch Sweeney. Where are you going? He asked. Well, I'm going down to the store to buy a pencil. I'm getting my life under control, I told him. What's it been doing? He asked. Just the usual, I said. As a result, I never get anything accomplished. I never accomplish anything either, he said. Why don't we stop by Kelly's for a beer and you can tell me how to get my life under control as well? Mm, okay. We went into Kelly's Bar and Grill. Kelly himself was working the bar. Tiffany, the waitress, was arm wrestling Milt Logan for double her tip or nothing. Two candles were situated so that the loser got his hand forced down onto one of them. Tiffany was winning. Stop, stop, screamed Milt. I give up. Kelly chuckled. Good thing I, I don't let Tiffany light the candles, he said. Otherwise, every one of your burns or every one of you bums would have their hair burn off the back of your hands. Oh, yeah, wretch. Oh, yeah, wretch said to Kelly. Well, me and Pat can beat the socks off of you and Tiffany at pool. You think so, do you? Kelly said, vaulting over the bar. Rack em up, Tiff. How much per game? By the end of a few games of pool, getting my life under control had already cost me $12. Then old Krabby Walters came over and asked if Wretch and I wanted to see his new boat. Sure, I said. I love to look at boats, but we better hurry. It's starting to get dark. We went down to the marina to look at Krabby's boat. I would have guessed it's vintage at early 
vintage at early 17th century, except it was made out of aluminum. The motor looked prehistoric. You fix this thing up, Krabby? It'll be a pretty fair boat, Red said. Jumping Jehoshaphat, cried Krabby. It's already fixed up. Oh, Red said, and a mighty nice job of it, too. Thanks, Krabby said. You boys hop in and I'll take you for a little spin. Gee, it's pretty darn cold out and it's almost dark, I said. <clears throat> and the wind is coming up. Jumping Jehoshaphat, cried Krabby. What kind of wimps are you two? Hop in. Wretch and I hopped in, trying to avoid the rusty gas tanks. The whole boat smelled of gas. Krabby jerked on the starter cord no more than 50 times before the motor roared to life, somewhere beneath the cloud of smoke. I wasn't sure whether the motor was running or on fire, but Krabby soon emerged from the cloud, a big grin on his face. <laughs> Burrs like a kitten, don't it? We bolted out onto the lake, the motor coughing and spitting, and occasionally screaming in agony. A couple of hundred yards from shore, it died. Just have to adjust the throttle a little, Krabby said calmly, moving the motor cover and tossing it with a clatter into the bottom of the boat. The wind had picked up. Icy waves began to toss the boat this way and that, mostly that, which was away from the land. Darkness had clamped a lid on the lake. One of, one of you boys got a flashlight on you. Actually, he, he asked the question. One of you boys got a flashlight on you? Krabby asked. I can't see a dad blame thing. Not me, Reg said, staring at the waves. Me neither, I said. I just went out to buy a pencil. The situation was getting on my nerves. Well, no matter, Krabby said. I got an old gas lantern in here somewhere. Ah, there it is. I'll get us some light in here in a sec. Wait, I said. Do you think it's such a good idea to light a lantern with all this gas in here? Wretch inched his way toward the bow of the boat, and I inched after him. No problem, Krabby said. He touched a match to the lantern. Flame shot up six feet. Wretch and I started or stared in horror at the rusty gas tanks, now brilliantly illuminated, so we could study in detail the full extent of their deterioration. Jump! cried Krabby. Wretch and I jumped for our lives, leaving poor Krabby to fend for himself. He never even heard the splashes or the muffled shrieks so closely associated with plunges into icy water. I surfaced right next to the boat, expecting to see Krabby doing an imitation of a Roman candle but he was just standing there with a lantern turned down to a modest glow. Pinja Harshafat, he muttered, completing his favorite oath. One of these days, I'm going to buy me a new lantern. Now, if one of you boys would... Hey, where'd you go? Krabby eventually got the motor going and towed Wretch and me back to the dock. Then he drove us to Kelly's to thaw out. Naturally... The boys wanted to hear about our adventure. Krabby told a long, involved story about how he had saved our lives, starting with when he was five years old. Then Wretch had to arm wrestle Tiffany for double the tip or nothing. But with Kelly gone, this time with the candles lit, finally, he drove me home. How long do you suppose before the hair grows in again? He asked, blowing on the back of his hand. Probably a couple of months, I said. Who cares? I lost five bucks betting you could take Tiffany. Getting my life under control had already cost me $17, and I haven't even started. When I got home, Bun was already in bed. Where does the time go? Next morning, I got up bright and early and sat down to do some serious work on controlling my life. Where's the pencil? I asked Bun. Into chapter one. Chapter number two is Strange meets Matilda Jean. And until next time, peace from West.